We're going to carry on here in the study of James. I always like to remind you I get less and less and go back, uh, don't go back as far, and I make the uh, where we are shorter. But it's very important uh, when you're studying the Bible, especially when you're looking at letters. Uh, I, I, when you're studying a letter, to, to try to track the flow of thought in it is, is important because it alters how you understand you know, what's being said. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's critical, so I like to at least let it, let it be clear how I understand it so you can then weigh how I understand it and see if you think I'm on the right track, and then if you think not, then you keep digging. But uh, in chapter 1, verses 2 through 12, remember James, there he encourages his readers to endure the oppression that they're experiencing at the hands of their unbelieving rich neighbors, and he does that in a number of ways, and I won't go through those. But in, in verses 2 through 12 of chapter 1, that's what he's in doing. He's encouraging them to endure that oppression, trying to strengthen them for that. And then in chapter 1, verses 13 to 18, he warns them against slandering God during their trials, which is a temptation. He commands them not to ascribe evil intent to God. That's this idea when being tested, don't say you're being tempted by God. So he warns them to do that, and he explains that God is their ultimate benefactor, one who seeks to do only good for them. That's who God is and what he's trying to do. So in the pain of trials and difficulties, when you're tempted or you start to think, listen, uh, God is really my enemy, he says, don't do that. Uh, you don't ascribe evil intent to God. He's your ultimate benefactor. Then where we are now in this longer section, 119 to chapter 2, verse 13 here, James is calling them to be doers of the word during trials. You see, our tendency would be to say, well, when you're trials, you're, you're being oppressed, you're a victim. I don't want to call you to righteousness in that time because that would simply be adding to your burden. But the people of God are called to be righteous, and James is not reluctant to call those who are being oppressed to righteousness and holy living in the midst of their trials and oppression. So he calls them to do that. In 119 to 25, he urges them to be doers of the word with regard to their anger against their oppressors. So he says, look, you know, you, this anger is not conducive to the righteousness God desires. He urges them to be doers of the word with regard to their anger against oppressors. In verses 26 to 27 of chapter 1, he urges him to be doers of the word with regard to the sinful, hostile speech that presumably flows from the anger. So here I am angry, sinfully angry, not righteously indignant, sinfully angry, and he says you need to stop that. And then there's also this hostile, evil, sinful speech. He doesn't spell it out, but you see that you know, there's all kinds of uh, things I can say about people. And apparently that's flowing from this anger. In verses one, 20, chapter 1, verse 26, 27, he says, Look, be doers of the word with regard to that sinful, hostile speech. Yes, those who are oppressing you, you know, the, those who are doing that, the oppressors, they're wrong in mistreating the poor and the powerless. That's true. The poor and the powerless, as epitomized by that phrase, orphans and widows. They, yes, it's true, they are wrong to be doing that, to be oppressing the poor and the powerless, to be mistreating them. But pure and undefiled religion, he says, the way I understand him, pure and undefiled religion involves not only caring for the poor, as the oppressed people apparently are, they want to ride that aspect of it and say, yes, yes, look, they're not looking out, they're, they're mistreating the poor. They're not living up to God's uh, call how they should be. They're sinning. They're doing wrong. He says it's true that pure and undefiled religion involves caring for the poor and the oppressed, for widows and orphans, that phrase that symbolizes the poor and the oppressed. But it involves more than that. It also involves keeping oneself unspotted by the world, and that's where his readers were failing. You see, they were failing in... in, in with regard to keeping themselves unspotted by the world, they were failing in that regard by engaging in and ignoring their sinful speech. So here they are, just pouring out sinful speech, arising out of their anger, and they don't care about that. They have exempted that, whether they've justified it because we're being oppressed and we ought to be able to say these things, but he will have none of it. The Spirit of God writing through James says, you have to stop that. Stop that. 
You have to repent of your anger. You have to repent of the, the sinful speech. And in chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, he calls them to be doers of the word with, with regard to their preference toward the rich. So here in this section, he's calling them to be doers of the word with regard to your hostility toward the oppressors. Okay, you're, you're to be doers of the word in both, in both the anger and sinful speech. You're to be doers of the word. With regard to your attitude or your preference toward the rich. He identifies the problem he's talking about in chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. See some it looks like they were trying to curry favor with the rich when they showed up at their meetings. They sought to ingratiate themselves to the rich. As, as I said last week we would say they sought to suck up to them. You know, But they were doing that at the expense of the poor. Saying oh, oh here you, hey bub. <laughs> Here, you sit on the floor. Oh, you sit here. They were dishonoring the poor man. You see, so they were doing this at the expense of the poor. And James commands them to practice their faith without that kind of partiality. So he tells them that's chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Then in chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, that's where we were when we ended. He says, listen, my beloved brothers, did not God choose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich exploit you? And do they not drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? So here he tells him, I'll repeat a little bit of what I said last week and then we'll we'll move on. In discriminating against the poor, he says, look, you're acting contrary to God. God didn't discriminate against the poor. That's not how he acted at all. And you can see that he chose them to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom as evidenced by the number of poor believers in their congregation. They're surrounded by poor believers. He says, obviously, God doesn't have a problem with the poor because look at all your poor brothers and sisters. And Paul makes this same point in in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 to 31, where there in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31, To further his argument that the gospel that he preached stands in direct contradiction to human expectations about God, he turns to the existence of the Corinthians themselves as believers. He says, the gospel I preach is in contradiction, okay, contradiction to these expectations about God. And he says, just look at who you are. Just look at who you are. The very fact God's church is made up mostly of nobodies. Is what he tells the Corinthians. The fact the church is made up mostly of nobodies, people from the lower classes, that shows the foolishness of God that confounds the wise. Let me read to you a quote from a uh, man named Celsus. He was a Roman opponent of Christianity in the late second century. And listen to how what he says, how he ridicules Christianity in these words. There, meaning Christians, their injunctions are like this. Let no one educated, no one wise, no one sensible draw near. For these abilities are thought by us to be evils. But as for anyone ignorant, anyone stupid, anyone uneducated, anyone who is a child, let him come boldly. By the fact that they themselves admit that these people are worthy of their God, they show that they want and are able to convince only dishonorable and stupid and only slaves women and little children now this is this roman critic Celser, late second century this is how he characterizes the church of the living god you see so what james is saying he says isn't it clear to you that god hasn't discriminated against the poor and yet here you are acting contrary to god and doing that see when god called out a people to be his he called them without regard to social status, without regard to their standing in the eyes of the world. That's how God worked. An equal opportunity God who called them out without regard to their social standing. And many who had status, they were offended that their status was ignored. What are you, crazy? Do you know who I am? What I've gone through? Do you know my pedigree and that kind of thing? David Garland comments on that text in 1 Corinthians. He says, when Paul proclaimed the word of the cross, it did not attract the wise and powerful. They're not excluded. 
but tend to exclude themselves by rejecting the wisdom of the cross, which does not honor their achievements, but pours contempt on their pride. You see, so that's why, that's where the, so why were there, why, why was the church the way Celsus caricatured it, where it's just all these, you know, mostly of lower classes, the way Paul spoke about it in 1 Corinthians 1, poor, not from the, you know, most of you aren't from the upper crust, ritzy. You see, why was it that way? And I think this is it right here. Is that the people with status didn't want to be broken before the cross and come and be equal at the foot of the cross with those they judged to be their inferiors. And so they they chose to disproportionately ignore the cross. See, the church was filled with riffraff in the world's eyes. That's how we'd put it, riffraff in the world's eyes to make clear that salvation has nothing to do with human status or standing. It's not an entitlement of the privileged. You see, Christianity in a relationship with God is not an entitlement of the privileged. It's not a matter of human accomplishment, but it's a completely undeserved gift that broken people receive when they come to Christ. You see, not, not anything that, that I sit here and say, listen, nobody stands clean before God because of his intellect because of his education, because of his pedigree, because of his social class. None of that means anything in terms of a person's relationship with God. The, the most ignorant, uneducated, poorest person stands level at the foot of the cross with the most exalted, achieved, accomplished person in the world. You see, and this is a thing that offends some people of status, and they don't like it. And he says, look... Uh, In favoring the rich, as you're doing here, in favoring the rich, they were honoring those who for the most part were unbelievers and were engaged in exploiting them, dragging them into court and slandering the name of their Lord. He says, look, you know, he explains to them the foolishness of what they're doing. Now, most of James's readers, they probably were poor agricultural laborers, laborers who were being bled dry by unscrupulous rich landowners and merchants. We don't know exactly the situation, but they're probably agricultural laborers who are getting squeezed and bled dry, and as part of that process, they're rich oppressors. They undoubtedly use their uh, wealth and influence with the courts to secure favorable verdicts against the poor. Would that shock anybody? Would that shock anybody if I'm a rich landowner there in the first century and these people are dirt poor, that I've got sway with rich and powerful people who are in. You say, that shouldn't be that way. I know it shouldn't be that way. <laughs> but would it surprise anyone? See, they're, they're exploiting you. They're dragging them into court. Moo says, he writes in his commentary. In fact, Moo's written two commentaries on James. But he writes, he says, practices familiar in every age, such as for, forcing people to forfeit their land for late payments of mortgages. Now, that may be an anachronism. I don't know that they had technically mortgages. But you get the same idea that somebody had land and you didn't do what I wanted and I'm kicking you out. Uh, And I will come in here and with my buddies in the courts and we'll make sure that we squeeze you. But he says, uh, forfeit their land for late payments of mortgages, insisting on ruinous interest rates for any monetary help and the like are probably in view. You see, these things are age old. You see all in the Old Testament the idea of rich people using their position to exploit poor people. This is part of sinful humanity. Okay, so this isn't anything that's, that's unique here. Now, the fact the rich are slandering the name of Christ, it suggests that their oppression of the poor Christians was at least in part motivated by religious discrimination. In other words, they're blaspheming, he says. Do they not blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? So these guys have an attitude about their Christian faith And that is in part energizing their oppression and their discrimination of them. They don't like this Christ stuff. And so they use that to help justify mistreating them. Well, look, these people need that. They deserve that. Maybe they thought they're heretics. I don't know what they thought. But it seems clear that they are somebody here who has an attitude about these people as Christians. And then he says in chapter 2, verses 8 to 13, he speaks of the seriousness of this sin he's talking about. This sin of showing partiality to the rich at the expense of the poor. And he says, if you truly fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin being convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps all the law but stumbles in one part has become guilty with regard to all parts. For the one who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Speak and act in this manner as those about to be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment will be merciless to the one who did not show mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Showing partiality. Dishonoring the poor is a transgression of the royal law. It is a transgression of the royal law, a transgression of the requirement in Scripture in Leviticus 19, 18, to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, showing this partiality, dishonoring the poor is a transgression of this royal law. Now, it's called the royal law because it was singled out by Christ, the king of kings. You see, the king of kings, the ultimate in royalty. It was singled out by Jesus Christ, the fulfiller and the authoritative interpreter of the law. He singled it out as the essence of the interpersonal aspects of the Mosaic law. You can see that in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. See, it was taught by Christ as an expression of God's will for Christians. Right? That's what it is. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's this, this is the sum of things. It was taught by Christ as an expression of God's will for Christians. James isn't binding the Mosaic law on Christianity. He's binding Christ's royal law. So he's telling them, listen, if you dishonor the poor man, if you show partiality to the rich and treat the poor man like he's dirt, you're violating this commandment. You're violating this royal law. Now, you can see this is confirmed by the fact this royal law is described in verse 12 here as the law of freedom. In chapter 1, verse 25, the phrase the law of freedom there, it clearly has reference to the gospel. And you can see that because in 121, it refers to the implanted word that is able to save your souls. Okay, so he's not talking about binding the Mosaic law. He's talking about Christ's royal law. And how they're treating the poor this way violates that. He's calling them to be doers of the word and they got to knock that off. They have to stop that. Even if they kept the royal law on every other occasion. Which of course uh, that would be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> but even if they kept the royal law on every other occasion, that would not lessen their guilt with regard to violating it in terms of partiality. You see, that wouldn't lessen their guilt. The royal law, like the Mosaic law, it's broken as a unit. Now, what does that mean? No violation of it is petty. That's the point he's trying to get across, you see. No violation of it's in petty. No violation becomes de minimis in light of prior compliance. You don't get to say, listen, I'm going to treat the poor man like dirt. But do you know that I've done this, 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 this. So all of these things make this nothing. No. It doesn't work that way. And that's what I think he's getting them to see here. The royal law, see, it's viewed as a body of particulars that, that's encompassed by the summary command, you, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, that's the summary command, but that encompasses a lot of particulars. As I've said many times in, in teaching classes, Christians in the New Testament, they were not required to obey other than as an accommodation. Commandments of the Mosaic Law relating to circumcision, sacrifices, the priesthood, feasts, holy days, ritual purity laws, and food laws. You can see throughout in the New Testament, they were not obligated to obey those commandments of the Mosaic law. Those things point to deeper realities that found their fulfillment in Christ, and they said, so we don't abide by those things. Food laws, circumcision, what is Paul doing when he's going around saying, no, you don't bind those things on people. 
That's not part of, that's not part of the royal law. The fundamental ethical requirement for the Christian, the, the bullseye for the Christian is love. Okay, that's the heart of our ethical obligation. It is love. You can see that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. Romans 13, 8 to 10. Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. That is the essence of it. That is the center of it. But some specific conduct is unloving, you see, and some conduct is loving. Some specific conduct is loving and other conduct is not. It's not like you just say, well, it's just about love. And it has no content to it. No, love is the center, but love has objective content. You see, it includes a body of particulars. Love is a center, but there are definite requirements, do's and don'ts. Dare I say that? Do's and don'ts on how love is to express itself. Look what Paul says in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, especially in verse 9, Paul says, he, he indicates that the command to love your neighbor as yourself, well, that command what? That command encompasses the commands not to commit adultery, not to murder, not to steal, not to covet, and other commands that he doesn't specify. You see, so the commandment is what? It is love, but what does it do? It incorporates, it encompasses those specific commands of the Mosaic law. And so it's not just this vague thing that's out in the air that I can do anything I want and say, but I love. You see, I sleep with my neighbor's wife, but I love my neighbor. Nonsense. You see, there's objective content to it. So the Christian, though not being under the Mosaic law, not being under the set of commands, I've said this many times, I never know what sticks, but not under the Mosaic law in terms of not being under the set, the body, the package, the corpus. I don't know how else to say it. Not under the body of commands that are part of the Mosaic Covenant. The Christian, though not being under that set of commands that's part of the Mosaic Covenant, upholds the royal law, the transcendent moral requirements that are included in that covenant. So you see we have a body of commandments that are associated with the Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law includes things that are peculiarly covenantal. Things that separated Israel from the Gentiles. Things like circumcision, all the food laws and these kinds of things. These things that are amoral, creating civil or ceremonial distinctions to keep them separate from the Gentiles. But the Mosaic law also includes what? Does it not include eternal moral principles like honor your mother and father? Sure, because these things will be pulled out and be called on. In the New Testament. You see, so it's like I, I, I thought about a library, you see, or a deck of cards, however you want to do it, whereas the, the entire set is abolished in the sense that, look, as a unit, it doesn't apply. But that doesn't mean that we're not without ethical obligations. It's this ongoing moral law that's centered in love that is the law of Christ. That Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 9, 21 and Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. That's why Paul can say in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is everything. You go, wait. You say, well, circumcision is a commandment. He says, I'm not talking about those commandments. I'm not talking about those things that were these peculiarly covenantal obligations that were these amoral things that separated Israel from the Gentiles. Circumcision is nothing. He doesn't bind that on anybody. Circumcision or uncircumcision, who cares? Keeping the commandments of God is everything. And we've turned things so around that we say, if you want to call somebody to keep the commands of God, that makes you a legalist. Look, I used to have hair, you see. It does not. Paul can say keeping the commandments of God, that's everything. It's important. And James, that's what James is on right here. James tells them, 
James tells them that they must speak and act as those who are going to be judged by this law of freedom. Who are going to be judged by the ethical requirements of the gospel. The idea you see that the gospel, it is a call for us to come and die. For us to give our lives in trust of who Jesus is. And that has an ethical component because the one we confess as Lord calls us to be a certain type of person. So these things are bound up. And James sits here, he says, look, he tells them you have to speak and act as the one who's going to be judged by this law of freedom. Judged by the ethical requirements of the gospel. Because those who reject the ethics of faith. Those who reject the ethics that are an inherent part of the gospel call, those who turn their backs on the ethics of faith, such as by not showing mercy to the poor, the case he's on, such as by not showing mercy to the poor, they reject faith and thus reject the mercy that faith receives. You see, you can't have one without the other. There are two ends of a stick. You see? There are two ends of a stick. And those who jettison the one have jettisoned the whole stick. And so he's telling them, listen, you have to, you have to understand it. This is the same idea behind those verses that speak of one's works as a basis for judgment. You see, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, that puzzles us. We look at that. I didn't quote that because it was long but there are others like John 5 28 and 29 do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tomb will hear his voice come out those who've done good to the resurrection of life those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment those who've done good life evil judgment Revelation 22 20 verse 12 he says I saw the dead great and small standing before the throne the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done I'm going to talk about this more as James goes on. You say, how can that be? We are not saved by our works. I know that. James knows that. The Spirit of God knows that. So what's he talking about? You see, and it's this idea that these things are a unit. You cannot divorce faith from life. That is baloney. That is some modern thing that says, I get to be God. I'm going to claim faith and live on the throne of my life and do whatever I want. That's not faith. That's not faith. That's something. But it's not what the Bible calls faith. Douglas Moose says in his commentary, he says, Showing mercy is in fact just what the love command requires, verse 8, and what James' readers are failing to do when they dishonor the poor man. This relationship between mercy and concern for the poor is explicit in Zechariah chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. You see, this is an echo of Jesus' parable of the unmerciful unmerciful servant in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, verses 23 to 35. But here, mercy being understood as concern for the poor. You see, it's an echo of that. Moose says... James also, in effect, transforms Jesus' beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, into its opposite. Cursed are those who are not merciful, for they will not be shown mercy. Now, when we hear that, you you say, wait a minute, but doesn't Jesus in other places say, if you don't forgive somebody, you won't be forgiven? Well, is that works? Is he saying that by forgiving somebody, you earn salvation? Of course not. Isn't he saying that by somebody who has faith in me, the one who has forgiven you, that will flow out into forgiveness? And if it doesn't flow out into forgiveness, then you don't know me. Right? So so that's that's the idea. Anyway, Mu goes on and he says, Cursed are those who are not merciful, for they will not be shown mercy. Being merciful in these these texts suggests is not merely a feeling of concern, but involves actively reaching out to show love to others. The discrimination that James's readers are practicing is the opposite of such mercy, and if they continue on this path, they will find at the end of their lives a judgment without mercy. This is powerful. We don't like looking at this. But here, you see, in this, like he sits here and he says, verse 12, speak and act in this manner as those about to be judged by the law of freedom for judgment... You need to do this. You need to stop this partiality and treating these poor people like they're dirt. And he says, you need to stop that for judgment will be merciless 
to the one who did not show mercy. And then he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. He's not talking about God's mercy triumphing over God's judgment. He's talking about if you have the ethics of faith that bubbles out into showing mercy to the poor as I'm calling you to, you will not, you will not be judged. That's the idea. You see? And he, he, he keeps going. He'll go on. James says 2.14 to 7, What good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Some of your translations say, can that kind of faith save him? Well, what kind of faith? The kind of faith that is mere intellectual assent. The kind of faith that says, I believe A, B, and C, but I will not surrender my will to it. I believe A, B, and C. I believe Jesus is Lord. He died for me. Crucified, raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, Lord of all. I believe those things are true, but I will treat him as though they are not true. Right? That's what he's talking. Can that kind of faith, that kind of faith, which is not biblical faith, can that kind of faith save somebody? He says, if a brother or sister is naked and lacking daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, but you do not give to them what is necessary for the body, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it, is, if it does not have works, is dead. You see, what has he been doing? James, from 119 to 213, he has been calling his readers to be doers of the word. Not to just sit here and hear it, not to be like the man that looks in the mirror and says, well, what do you know? Okay, that's good. Uh, okay, I'm through with that. Not to be that way, but to be somebody who allows that word to grab them and conform them so that they change in accordance with that word. So that's what he's been doing from 119 down to 213. He called them to, to good works with regard to their hostility toward their oppressors, both in their anger and in their evil speech. He called them to good works in their preference toward the rich, dishonoring the poor. He's been calling them to good works, and now he defends that call against the circulating false doctrine that works are irrelevant or insignificant for those in Christ. He's been calling them. You need to do this, do this, repent, be this way, take the ethics of the gospel seriously. It's important, it's important, you have to do it, do it, do it. And yet he apparently knows that among the audience, his audience, that there is an idea out there that works are irrelevant. You see, that works have no, they have no value. They're insignificant for those in Christ. Now this probably originated as a misunderstanding of Paul's doctrine of justification by faith. Paul talks about justification by faith in many places. Galatians 2, you can see it. Romans 3, Romans 4, Ephesians 2, and many other places. And you can see hints of this tendency to misunderstand Paul. We don't have to guess about that. Could people misunderstand Paul? You see hints of the tendency. You see it in Romans, which is a bit later maybe 10 years later, but you still see the, the potential for taking Paul's doctrine and misunderstanding it and turning it into a license to sin. You see in Romans 3, 7, and 8, but if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? If God's into this forgiving business, we'll give him a lot to forgive. We'll really help, help him. You see, and he says, and why not do evil so good may come as some people slanderously charge us with saying their condemnation is just. Romans 6, 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Romans 6, 15, what then? Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. You can look at what he says in, in Galatians 5, 13. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. You can see there was this potential in Paul's doctrine, but Paul never allowed that to turn him from preaching boldly the truth that our salvation is by grace, through faith, not by works. The fact people misunderstood it didn't shake him off that. Now, Paul, Paul began preaching, preaching in Syrian Antioch, you see in Acts chapter 11, in the mid-40s, and you have Jewish Christians who were scattered by the persecution following Stephen's death, they had traveled to Antioch and other places around Palestine. You can see that in Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now, some of those Christians, it looks like they had either heard or they themselves had misinterpreted Paul's 
uh, gospel, and they had turned it into an excuse for moral laxity. They had turned it into, they had reducing faith to mean simply intellectual assent. They had taken Paul's doctrine of salvation by grace through faith, not by works, and divorced it and said, no, it's by faith in the sense of if I just think these things. Well, Paul would have never said that. And I'll show you that. You know that, I hope. But he would have never just said that. But they apparently had gotten that, as you saw the potential in the, those texts there, to turn it in. See, so news of this misunderstanding had apparently reached the church in Jerusalem. James is writing to these people who are having ethical difficulties. He calls them to be doers of the word. And now knowing that this is among them, this teaching is among them, he's going to defend his call that they be doers of the word in light of that false teaching that he knows about. Okay, so he does that. He says, look, what, he, what does he do here? He, he first shows them. He shows the error of that doctrine. He does it by an everyday example. See, this is, what, this is what James is doing the way I understand him. He's showing the error of this idea of what we would call, quote, faith only, meaning faith divorced from life, which is not faith. Okay? And he, he shows them the error of it by, by first showing them an example from everyday life. See, just as lip service to the poor is of no value, who would know better than these people to whom he's writing? These poor Jewish Christians who are being oppressed they would know very well that, hey, how good is it when a guy sits here and says, hey, uh, hope it's all well for you. You're starving to death. And a guy says, hey, I hope all goes well for you. See, they know from their lives that lip service to the poor is of no value. So he says, so you see, in the same way, it's like the same idea. Just as you already understand very well that lip service to the poor is of, of no value, in the same way, faith without works is dead. You see, so he's using something they know from everyday life to make his argument. Look, faith without works is dead, just like you know that lip service with no skin on it is meaningless. Okay, he says, that's what I'm telling you about, uh, about faith that's divorced from works. Then he says in 2, 18 and 19, but someone will say, talking about a third party, will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. See, because biblical faith involves a surrender of the will, not simply an acceptance by the mind. Works are an inevitable companion of faith. See, because that's the nature of faith. So works are an inevitable companion of faith. They are faith's vital signs. So I keep looking for ways to resonate the concept. They're faith's vital signs. Demons believe there's only one almighty God. They believe that, you see. But because they're unwilling to what? They're unwilling to align themselves with that truth. They are unwilling to surrender and serve that one almighty God. They know it intellectually but because they're unwilling to act on it, to act consistently with it, what is their fate? Well, their fate is all they're left to do is they're left to shudder in fear. Even though they know that truth, what does that do for them? Does that save them? Does that help them? No. What are they left to do? Shudder in fear. Why? Because of the eternal fire that's promised to them in Matthew 25, verse 41. They know. They know that. So here he says, see, he shows them this error of faith only by the fate of the demons. First by an everyday example, then by the fate of the demons, and then he shows them from Scripture, and we'll just have time to get this teed up, and then, Lord willing, we'll carry on next week. But he says in chapter 2, verse 20 to 26, but are you willing to understand, O foolish man, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith worked with his good works, and that faith was made complete by the works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Ab and Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by a different way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, 
so also faith without works is dead. Now this is in the Bible, right? <laughs> this is the Bible. So uh, we, need to, we need to integrate everything. We can't just sit here and say, you know, this is something here. I don't want to talk about that. This is in the Bible, and he's going to show them here, uh, based on Scripture, how this idea, that this error of faith only is incorrect. Now, the faith that saves, as I've said many times, and I'll say many more times, the faith that saves, it's a living faith, a faith that finds expression in obedience. A dead faith is one that says, Lord, Lord, as Jesus says in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Well, a dead faith is one that says, Lord, Lord, and then acts as though that's not true. It's simply lip service. It's simply talk. It's not real. If it were real, no one who said, Lord, Lord, would turn around and blow him off. If you blow him off, you're not saying he's Lord. So if there's a genuineness to the confession, you see, that's, that's the idea, what he's talking about. To speak of a faith that has no works is like speaking of a human life that has no pulse, no respiration, and no brain waves. You see, those things are hallmarks of life. That's how it is with works. You see, they flow out of faith. And we'll carry on next week. Thank you.